forty twenty not live. If if I can be bothered, I'll put a black box in the bottom, and you'll have to guess who the mystery guest is who's uh, joining us for the first time in a while. Shall uh, I give it, you a clue? I'll give you a on. clue. Okay. I have to put a black is... box on you. <laughs> I guess banned from YouTube. Um, and and he's from the home of uh, stock car racing. Uh, massive, massive stock car racing. And uh, the 1986 World Snooker Champion. Uh, no, it's not Joe Johnson, it's Mark Wilson. Mark, you're back. How are you? Hi, Rhett. I'm all right, lads. How are we doing? Oh. All the better to see you. Oh, what a guy. I love the stock cars, by the way. I used to walk down towards Sul on, on an evening with my uncle and watch the stock cars. I'll probably make an appearance down there, I think, and have a watch of the old banger racing or whatever they've got on. That not, that's not nice to call John Keir's team banger race. Oh, well, come on, come on. We'll see, we'll see. It could be in for a tough year, I think, the Bulls, but we'll see. But we've got fixtures. We've got fixtures. We've something to pencil in a diary that we've only just remembered we needed for this year. Yeah. yeah. Do we get a discount on the first three months that we've not used? <laughs> but, it uh, yeah, it is, it is nice, though, isn't it, to have some games? It, is, it feels like it, a bit of, nor- dare I say, it feels like normality is returning, I think, which is nice. I think we we have got something to look forward to now, so fingers crossed we get on. And uh, I think with hindsight as well, all the stick RL got about the way it handled the pandemic, it's actually come out of it when with hindsight looking all right, I think, hasn't it? I think the, the great thing as well, if um, if anything is to be believed, and we, we have had a year of not really knowing what to believe, it looks like the World Cup is going to go ahead. That if everybody who needs to be vaccinated sort of is by August, then it's, it's increasingly likely that the end of the year is going to be a real rugby league jamboree, which, which again is... Uh, it's needed in these times, but I'm pleased for the people that are organising it because they, they also have done a tremendous job in the most difficult of circumstances. Mm-hmm. How, how was your end of 2020? I know you, you're still going to games and doing them on the radio. How, how did you find that whole experience? Obviously, you're doing football as well at the minute, which is without crowds as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, look, I get quite used to it, really. You know, you do miss the fans. They all build up to a game. But I think when you're at the game, I never really noticed that they're not there because you're concentrating on what's going on on the field and, um, it's a shame. I thought the Super League did really well with the grand final. I was there. It felt like it was a big occasion, even though there were probably only 30, 40 who was there. thought they did it really well, so I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. Look, it'll be great to get fans back. That's what we all want, and I think this might actually be a case where, because we don't get massive crowds, we might be helped out, and we might get crowds back quicker than, uh, quicker than some will, so fingers crossed on that one. Do we need to talk about Robert Elson? Because he's... Uh... He's leaving, and and we haven't spoken about him yet. Although, as it turns out, he may have been right about his uh, reservations on Toronto with the way that turned out in the end. But uh, would it be fair to say that he was almost doomed to fail from the start because he wasn't given any real power to to do anything because they had various people in the background pulling his strings? Well, I think we should let Phil answer because Phil was a big fan. Uh, So we'll let Phil go first, and I'll give you my thoughts on it. I was a big fan that he was somebody the sport needed if he'd been given the role that he should have been to enable him to carry that out. Um, There's been a lot of debate now that he's announced he's going on what does rugby league need? Well, what it needs is the right structure for anybody it brings in to to thrive, which this has proved over the last two and a half years is clearly not there. Um, It always was vested interest in that put him in there in the first place and then either um, undermined him or... Um, supported him when, when, when perhaps you know it, it, the the obvious indications were that it was an overduplication of resource, which I think we said right at the very beginning that there never seemed to be any point of having uh, two competitions vying for the same resources when um, this was pre-pandemic. That you know there, there isn't a lot out there to go. At. It needed to be a combined strategy, and if he was the right man to take it forward, he should have been at the very top of it and a decision maker. And and he never was. I can understand why he took the job. I can understand why I was offered the job. Um, I think you normally judge somebody by if they leave the the sport in a better place than where they started and even allowing for the pandemic, uh, I'm not sure that he has. Um, So I think there are some questions to be asked about what kind of a job did he 
did he actually do? Um, I think there's a whole interesting side debate now about um, equity finance, which was one of the things he was brought in to, to look at when clearly there, there wasn't a unanimous desire for it, which has led us again down a, an expensive cul-de-sac by the look of it. Um, I think it's really what you do from here. It, 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 the lesson of everything is in our history. Uh, we saw this, you know, 20 odd years ago when Super League broke away and uh, had had voices behind it that were going to do this, that and the other. And within 18 months was back because we're just not a big enough sport. Um, so, yeah, he was the right man, I think, in the wrong position. Mm. Fair enough. I, I it, It's very easy, I think, to criticise the stories that he's a failure, he's a failure. But I think Rich mentioned there, doomed to fail. I mean, you go back to that press conference, was it Lenigan that... With that big outburst, I forget what he said, but you just thought from that moment on, you thought this guy is he's a I know you don't want to be rude, but he's a puppet, isn't he? He's a puppet for the people who think they run the game. And I think I said when we had it all, when we initially spoke about this at the time is the people uh, at the top of the game have been at the top of the game for a long time. You like the Lennigans and the and the club owners, and they have overseen quite a lot of disasters in their time across the sport and. It just felt that whilst they were involved in the key decision making, I appreciate they put the money in, and of course they've got a right to have a say in what goes on. Of course, they've put a lot of money in the sport, but they've got a record of failure upon failure upon failure. So why was anything ever going to change with Elsa in charge? I think until they have the guts to say to someone, "We want you to run our sport as you see fit," and I don't put bonuses in or whatever. I do recall I said at the time, they, they should have made his salary dependent upon how, what TV deal he got. That should have been the, the big thing. And if he got us a great TV deal, he would have been seen to have been a success and therefore he should have got paid accordingly. But I think, is it circa 400 grand a year? So he's had a million quid and, and we've got nothing to show for it apart from a shot clock, I think. That, you know, bet people say, well, bet Fred have up their sponsorship. That was the proverbial open goal, wasn't it? You know, betting uh, sponsorship is... is prevalent everywhere you know you would argue have we got enough as a sport have we got enough has he got it on the cheap uh, Fred Dunn you know he's he admitted openly that he spent a million quid getting the snooker and he thought he got a bargain and I dare say he thinks the same about Super League because it's it is everywhere and you know so he's probably got a good deal it's probably us that's come out on the wrong end of that if, if you actually add the numbers up so was he doing? He was doing a fail, in my opinion. I, I think he still failed anyway. I mean, I you know worked for a national radio station. I've never actually been introduced to him. I've never spoken to the guy. And the part of people say, "Well, you aren't going out of my way to say hello to him." Whenever I see him in a room, whatever, he, he never came over and introduced himself. And I, I just think that if that's the leader of the sport, I think that's a pretty poor do, really. Um, I think we've inherited mass costs. You know, and the facts are he had no remit to improve anything because there are always going to be people prone against it. That showed you mentioned with the, the equity deal. Why were the terms not bashed out before he actually approached anyone? Because it was it a seven five split, I think. Seven approved the deal, five didn't, so we've got to pay seven hundred and fifty grand. So you had that onto his head. You know, you're talking you're, you're two million quid down and we've got nothing and then there's all the other costs of an office in Manchester. It's been an absolute disaster. I'm not saying it's all his fault, certainly not, but it's been a disaster. There's no getting away from that. Uh, and I think the sport, I think they need to be brave, the guys at the top. And I almost think the best way to do it, and it's something we've said for years, you need to decide who's going to be in the full-time game. And then if there's 16 or whatever, how many stakeholders in there, and they know they're not going to get relegated and kicked out, then there might be some willingness to allow someone to make big decisions that might not suit everybody. And I think until we get to that moment, the sport is is shrinking, I think, is my opinion. You almost think it... Oh, go on, sorry, Phil. I was just saying, you add into that, that over the last 25 years, there's never been more money in the sport. Um, mm. And we haven't benefited from that. We haven't invested in it. We haven't got reserves. We haven't got um, an expansion policy or whatever we might want to have based on the resource to do it. We are as much hand-to-mouth today as we were when we went full-time in, in 1995. And, and that's a criticism of the sport, not necessarily the latest person who's tried to, to run the sport. And I, it, it does go back to our identity. What do we want to be? What can we afford to be? What should we be in the modern world? How do we appeal to uh, a wider market, more broadcasters? 
Um, and, and I think the other thing that, that is the, the white elephant in the room is the way Toronto was handled. Because I think, again, we, we can now judge that a little bit more with hindsight. And if the investor who um, originally set it up was pulling out, if the second investor who was coming in wasn't the right man, that's one thing. That's one thing that the, the competition could have looked at and addressed and even held Toronto in abeyance as a club for at least a year because it, it would have benefited the competition not to play in it anyway in the year that we had in 2020. But I think the damning part of all that was saying there is no market for rugby league in North America. That looked to me as if, again, um, all you're doing is is stacking division against division and um, shows a, a complete lack of ambition from somebody who is supposed to be driving the sport forward. Um, so I think that was handled really badly from a PR I, point I don't, of view. Yeah, I, I agree, Phil. And yeah, I know a lot was made about the fact that he was asked to, Liv Olsey or whatever, was asked to show the books and everything. He sh- you know, that should be in the rules. If you want to come in at Super League, you've got, you know, you've got to show that you've got the money. And it's like, so well, I'll do it if you let us in, blah, blah. No, no, these are the rules, mate. If you want to be in, you can be in. And it, maybe Elsa should have come out and said, look, you show us you've got the money, I'll vote, I'll vote you in, no problem. But they didn't do that, and it's just like it's just another disaster, really. That you know that you like you said that goes on his CV because he was the man ultimately that that pulled the trigger on it, wasn't he? Absolutely. I, th- I also think his hands were tied on that as well because some of the people who clearly were behind putting him in that position had made their thoughts clear on what they wanted or didn't want from Toronto. And again, you can't make an impartial decision if the vested interest that put you in that position are telling you how they're going to vote on something before you've even had the vote. So uh, yeah. governance is a major issue in the sport. And, and the other point you picked up on about not speaking to you um, as part of a you know national radio outlet, the sport is absolutely desperate for a spokesperson. And we've seen on social media, the impact of uh, Kevin Sinfield, what Claire Balding can do, uh, even Keith Lee naming their gates after, Captain Sir Tom, yeah, you know, we're, we're we're doing things that get us national news, but we haven't got a spokesperson. It's not coordinated, mm. um, and for all the uh, the good things that Ralph Rimmer has said in going to government and stressing the community value of rugby league, we still don't have a go to person who speaks for the sport. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, if you you know if you rewind to why was Elston even appointed in the first place? And I know some of the clubs wanted rid of Nigel. And, I, you know, I've been looking up a lockdown. I've seen Nigel quite a bit now and I, I do talk to him. He clearly loves the game. There's no getting away from that. And for whatever reason, people wanted rid I actually respect that decision that they got rid of him. But I, I just, again, I think the, the reasoning behind it and the planning going forward wasn't put in place. And I'm not sure it is going to be done now. You know, you mentioned Ralph. He's been seen to have done a great job getting the government grant hindsight again says well we've probably got less than everyone else got I know we're little old rugby league we were right pleased about it at the time but was it that good a deal in the end you know and, and I'm not hearing from him again he's not a leader is he he's not a, it, and I think that's the problem is that you've got the RFL and the Super League you've both got leaders that are not leading and, and that that is a that's a big problem and where do we go with that you know do we pull resources again you know and move forward I don't know I don't know I think it's quite a it's always like the manager when the manager gets sacked. Oh, I've got to get the next one right. We've got to get the next one right. Well, they have to get this right because time is is very much against them now. The new TV deal and things like that needs sorting out, and it's going to be interesting how it goes. I think it should be like Chelsea or Watford and just sack a chief executive every six months and bring somebody else in to do the job. Yeah, but to be fair, you mentioned that, Rick, but the remit at Chelsea is clear. They, they, they want winners, and even if you win, you're probably going to get sacked. And I, look, I, I challenge anyone that goes to Chelsea and thinks they're going to be there for over a year is deluded anyway. But they know what the remit is, and they know that they'll be well backed, and they get, you know, they can never turn around at Chelsea and say, oh, well, I don't get any money to spend, or I didn't get this, I didn't get that. They get free rent to do whatever they want. And even if they win, they still get sacked. I just think we need someone that's got the authority to run the game on the proviso if they do a good job they either, I don't know get a profit share or however they want to do it and if they're not good they'll get sacked it's simple as that but you know we've mentioned it before people in rugby league have have left the organisation it, it never seems that anyone is you know you know you've got a job you get appraised on the work that you do if you've got a normal job when does anyone in rugby league ever been appraised and criticised when they've not done a good job and praised when they have done I, I just don't see it to be honest there's some great people work at the RFL uh, and at Super League. Some great people. They just need someone to lead the organisation so that their good work 
is made even better. But we don't even know what the parameters of success and failure are. Um, you know, that would be interesting in, in itself. You know, what would constitute success? Is it bringing in X, X level of commercial income? Is it, uh, you know, a television deal of a certain value? You know, is it more teams playing the game? Is it participation numbers? Is it column inches in national news? You know, what actually are the, the criteria by which anybody running the sport is judged? Well, and again, you, you go back to, uh, you, I, as I said, with a TV deal, if you just said to Rob else, look, Robert, we need a deal, minimum 35 mil. If you get that, we'll give you I don't know, half a mil or a mil, whatever. Right? It's irrelevant, really. But then there's a, there's, a, there's a line being drawn in the sand that he's got to try and achieve, and we can see whether he's achieved that or not. Uh, and I just don't think that that is, I don't think that that's been done properly. And I think that's a big worry for me. I think the other thing about Nigel that you mentioned, and it's it's right to bring it up, is that I think the game knew that he was going to be leaving anyway. I, I think that there is a timeline to be done about the appointment of Robert Elston and the departure of Nigel Wood. And again, you know, if there hadn't been such a rush to put our own man in and see our competition as separate from the rest of the game, um, a little bit more uh, patience and foresight that Nigel was leaving after the 2017 World Cup anyway. Um, have we incurred an expense we, we didn't even need to if you go back? To well, that I, think if, I think if you talk to, certainly from the people I've spoken to within the game, that, that Robert has actually done a lot of good work dealing with that split, the RFL Super League split. I and mean, there's a hell of a lot of work he's had to do that he's gone into that that, We'll probably never see, never be made aware of. That's in the rule, you know, whatever it is. So I think he has had his purpose. And I think those, again, within the game will say that the money they've saved by splitting from the RFL out of the TV deal will say, well, he's probably paid for himself in that respect, but it still feels like that money's been wasted and could have been better used. Um, again, I agree. They wanted rid of that. And I understand why they wanted, they wanted to take control of their own future. Well, they haven't done that, have they? They haven't. No. They're still in the same mess that they were before. And you know, this this seven hundred and fifty grand for the equity deal is proof, if ever it were needed, they cannot be trusted to do the right thing. Because what suits two clubs at the bottom doesn't suit the two at the top. Someone needs to come in and say, "Look, this is how we're doing it, guys. If you don't like it, you know, put your club up for sale. Do whatever you want. You don't have to put the money in." And I, I don't know. I just think they need to take that out. And I think the only way we're going to get to do that is if you remove the threat of relegation. I think that's the only way that some clubs will hand over their little bit of power um, is on the proviso that it doesn't get them kicked out of Super League. And I think that might be the bullet that we have to bite, you know, to uh, to move the game on. Because, again, we, we're never talking about the rugby, are we? You know, the grand final out of the, the last touch of the ball. You know, the, the rugby league is the great thing. It's the running it that's the disaster. And it, time and time again, it, it's proved... Jakku, um, you mentioned the championship, and, and obviously Rugby Union have stopped relegation this year in the hope that Saracens get promoted again from the championship. Nothing's been announced yet in terms of what's going to happen at the bottom end of Super League and the top end of the championship in League One. Can you see it like, being like last year where games are getting cancelled, this, that and the other, we go to points uh, percentage and there, there's no legitimacy to have a team relegated. And again, we, we have the similar situation. No, I think the criteria will be quite strong. I, I think, you know, you've got to work on the fact that hopefully, you know, in August, September, we might have all been jabbed anyway, which would mean cases really, if, if teams do the right thing. And again, we're all quick to criticise Hull, I think, with the first one. It's happened everywhere in every sport, hasn't it? Every single sport, it's happened. So maybe a few people owe Hull an apology and, and actually an element of praise to all the clubs that did get their fixtures fulfilled, you know? I don't think that will be the case. I think the criteria will be strong. But again, it all comes down to what does a TV deal look like? What does the Super League look like? And how many times have we had this conversation this time of year? What's the plan? Tell us what the plan is and we'll get behind it. There isn't one at the minute, and that's the, that's the worry, that's the frustration. I, I think you met the game full, I know Phil's mentioned this a lot of times, choose between full and part-time. We're not saying if you don't go into Super League now, you can never get in. Maybe you've got to apply for a franchise or whatever in due course. That can all be looked at, but I think we need to set the criteria 
Um, and exp- I think it needs to expand Super League. I think we need to expand it and um, we need to get more teams in there and go from there. I think we we spoke about this towards the end of last year, what would 2021 look like? Bearing in mind, this is the last year of the TV deal. Um, and I think there is a case to say it's a year because of what happened in 2020 that those 12 clubs deserve a degree of protection, even if it's just for one year. But I think you've also got to keep the interest going in the championship. And the uh, I think the bids that were put in by the clubs that who didn't uh, get the the elevation that Lee did need rewarding. So I think you would, like Rugby Union have done, you would still have an element of promotion. You just would ring fence the 12 that are in there. Now, in an ideal world, but it's the ideal world is completely contingent upon what kind of money you can get from Sky. And it may well be that this is part of the negotiation that is going on with Sky. As you say, well, in 2022, we will have 14 teams in Super League. We'll have one um, space held over perhaps for a reincarnation of a Toronto type team, or maybe if expansion is on the agenda, uh, Toulouse will be given a nod towards uh, being allowed to come up because it will help the game in France. Plus there is another spot open for the team that wins promotion on the field. So you've got 14 teams in Super League in 2022, possibly 2023 and 2024. So that's your first three year, if you like, licensing period for this format. Uh, you then go to Sky and say, look, we know we're not going to get an eight-year deal from you. Uh, those days are gone. We know that we're going to have to renegotiate hard to get anywhere near the amount of money that we need. But what we'd like to get is enough to fund 14 teams at the level uh, that they're currently being funded at in Super League. And if that means... Uh, you know, you were going to give us 30 million, but actually it's now 35 because we're going to give you in exchange uh, two more teams in the division, an expansion team guaranteed, whoever that is, and a team, uh, you know, who's worked their way up through through the divisions. Then I think that's an equitable solution for for moving us forward, not just as a sport, but for the fans of the sport, for the for the commercial backers of the sport, for the for the television deal that will keep that sport afloat. But I think you've got to be doing that now. You've got to be saying that now. You've got to be negotiating that now. You've got to be outlining that that that's how it's going to work now. And we can't put this off any longer because the competition is going to start, uh, you you know, in the the mid to end of March. Uh, Even if it's behind closed doors, we need those decisions now. And and I I think we, we spoke about that in probably the last podcast we did when we were all together, that you have to look at the next maybe a year or two years after COVID as special years with special measures? Stunned silence. Yeah, stunned stunned silence. silence. <laughs> you speak too much sense, that's the problem. While you're with us, Mark, and, and, and I, I, want to, I want to talk about the championship and I want to talk about TV deals and such because you, uh, and I was very much the support act, had plenty of conversations around the time that <laughs> we own the rights to women's Super League for about a month. Mm. Um, mm. And, and we did speak about putting together a, a championship highlights programme, which didn't come to fruition for many and various reasons. And that's been muted again by supporters I've read on social media and forums. They're going with streaming, it seems, in our league. I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I'm intrigued to see how much they're going to charge people because from other sports, it goes anywhere from a fiver to 15 quid to get people to, to pay to watch these streams. How do you see that working? And, and, and what do we do? How do we get a, some kind of deal for the championship? I, I'm fully in favour, and I know it's almost impossible to do because of the money coming in or wanting money to come in, of having a game on YouTube every week for free for everyone to mm-hmm. watch. But I, I, I can understand that if you put... I'll use Bradford as an example because they've got a big supporter base. The Bulls aren't going to be happy at losing out on the uh, 5, 10, 15 quids they're going to charge people, are they? So I can understand why it won't happen. But that's the way I see of trying to build some kind of audience. Well, if you remember that, again, when we had this was all first mooted and people said, oh, you'll get Channel 4 in and all this and people should stream their own games until Met Fortune. I think we're realistic enough to know no one's going to make fortunes, but can they make it viable? whereby they make some profit on doing it. You know, they're going to have to do it. Fans can't get to the games at the minute. They need to be shown all of them. And I think, from what I understand, they all are going to be shown, which is great news. Um, I think they're working on a model whereby that they can do it as cheap as they can, but of a decent enough quality. 
But I'm with you. I, you and, and again, this comes down to the TV deal. Are we brave enough to say to Sky, well, you can pick all the games you want, but we want one game that we're going to show ourselves somewhere else. Are they? Did, would Sky be happy with that? Maybe they wouldn't, but they do that in the Premier League, don't they? You know, and I appreciate that. It's, it, it, they pay a lot of money, Sky, for that. You know, a hell of a lot of money, and that is their business model. I'm sure if they could afford to buy it all, they'd buy it all. But you know, they're not allowed to do for whatever reason. So, I think we need to be looking at that as a game. As a game, I'm with you. You've got to build an audience, and if you have a game, I think those Thursday night. I think the beauty about rugby league fans is they'll watch the game that's on the telly if they're not at a game themselves. I think this is a big thing we've had, that there's too many games on at the same time and then no games on when everyone wants to watch a game. So I think that's going to be something that they're working on. I think they need to set a date in the calendar. You know, I know the late kickoffs was mentioned in the championship and then every, everyone was kicking off, oh, we've got to go to work, we've got to do it, which I understand that to a certain degree. But you've also got to bear in mind that if you want pain in the championship, bearing in mind that, TV money blanket is going really. It's the Championship League one it affects, as opposed to Super League. I think directly, that's going to be gone. They've got to do whatever they can to make sure they're getting some money in. And um, streaming is the way forward. I think you'll. I think in in a few years, when you buy a season ticket, you'll get a pass to watch all the games whenever you want, however you want. You don't even have to go to the stadium, but you've bought a ticket so you can watch it. Um, yeah. They're not going to make a lot of money on it initially, Rich, but I think they've got to build up the audience and build up the demand and the championship. It'd be interesting whether they do get a TV deal with a another station or another broadcaster. I think it's possible, but they've got to prove that the, the demand is there. One thing I, I just want to bring up when we're talking about TV, what annoys me is when I see the adverts for women's sport on Sky and I see the cricket, I see the netball, I see the rugby union. Why are, this, why are the Super League ladies not on there? You know, that is a product that we can give to Sky for very little money. Why is that not? They took the grand final. You know, they've t- the BBC took the cup for. Why is that not? I'd like to see that on there. And I think that's a vehicle that we're still not maximising. You know, women's sport is massive. We're seeing it now. More and more um, broadcasters in, in football, etc., ladies, etc. We're going to get that in rugby league. We've already had that on, on Sky, of course, already. But I just think we need to... That is an element of our game whereby the standard, I think, is that good that it is a standalone product on its own. And I want to see that getting rewarded. I think that's something that the sport should be should be looking at as well as obviously the championship. But I'm going to be brutally honest, Rich, and this is something that we've, we've pointed out many times, is Sky pay for the top product. That's, they want the top product. They'll take the other bits if they have to take it as part of the deal. And maybe that's where we slipped up in the past that by not saying to Sky... You know, look, yeah, you can have Super League, of course you can, but as part of that agreement, every Monday night, every Thursday, whenever it is, you've got to do a championship game. And I think that would have helped the championship now. They're almost starting from scratch, I think, and that's going to be the, that's going to be the difficult thing because, as we know, in this COVID era, money's tight for everybody, be that Sky, be that the Premier League, be that Super League. We know that, so they're a bit of a standing start. I think it's going to be a tough one, but I do think the games will be streamed. Uh, and I think in the future you'll better watch it on your phone while you're sat in the pub. No problem at all. I think I think you've highlighted another anomaly there about governance, though, with the women's game. That it's run by the RFL, but the teams are effectively Super League teams. You know, the, yeah. the women, I, I know. You know, with the great respect to York and Featherstone, they make a massive contribution to women's rugby league. But the teams that are being associated with the women's element are the Super League teams. You can't have one body that looks after one and one body that looks after the other and go out and do a, a, a united television deal. I, I don't know if either of you have seen the first weekend of netball that has been on Sky this weekend. Again, it's across a number of platforms that include YouTube. You can see every mm. game. It's yeah. all on, under the banner of Sky. Um, I think they built it up again into a, a franchise league whereby there is buy-in across... Um, seeing, you know, Monday night, I sat and watched Leeds Rhinos play Saracens at netball. And you're just thinking, that is the way that sport is going. If you're going to appeal to a broadcaster, you've got to give them the, give them the broadest possible platform you can and the ability to sell 
that product to the widest possible audience you can. And you look at the sponsors who are involved in netball, who we don't have in, in Super League, and suddenly there is a model there that we should be looking to follow, both in terms of who is playing the sport and the, the widest reach it has, but also how it's shown. So that if you want to watch every single game, there is a platform for which you, you can do it. And it might be on main event, it might be on mix, it might be on YouTube, but you can follow the competition from beginning to end. There's no conflict of games. They all follow each other on consecutive days. Suddenly they've got a product there that seems vibrant, new and attracting uh, new money that isn't already in sport. And we could be part of doing something very similar if we were all one and, and selling it that way. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it is, it, it, that's the problem I think that we had last time with the TV deal is, oh, great, we're getting 40 million a season. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But there were no criteria on it. You know, you look at football, the old Papa John's trophy, whatever it is that you can have, you know, that gets its fair share of TV exposure because it's part of the bigger picture. They don't just go, oh, don't worry about that. And as a result, football gets good sponsorship for that. We can't push the lower end of the game because we haven't included it in part of our bigger offering. And you're right, that's where they should have been. You know, we we'll use it as a bargaining tool. Sky need content. They need content all the time. That's their thing, that there's live sport on all the time. And you've hit a point, you know, could we have it so that there's women's Super League on on a Tuesday night? And I appreciate it might not suit everyone with work, blah, blah, blah. But if Leeds are playing Bradford or York are playing Featherstone, there's not that much travelling involved. I'm sure we could get round it. And I just think we need to look at it. I, I think I still think we're missing a big thing there with the women's sport. And I think as part of the overall package, I certainly think, having watched a lot of championship, it has got a place somewhere. We've just got to find someone that's willing to pay for it. I think the well, next one after that will be wheelchair as well. And, and funnily enough, both of those competitions lead to a World Cup. So you build up to something, you have a, a major spotlight on it, and then you can go back to the domestic season in 2022 and beyond. It is it is a much more sellable product than we're making it. Yeah. And you, you, you know, I forget what the numbers were on that Kelsey Gentles tackle. Was it our 30 odd million people, whatever, yeah. in watch or it had so many million views? Where do you see a player? When does she play? I don't know COVID has dictated that we can't say, oh, she's playing next Sunday down at the jungle. I know that's happened, but we need a, we need to be pushing that because something like that will happen again. You know, there'll be a viral tr- The women will score a, a try like Johnny May scored at the weekend or whatever, you know, that we say every week in Super League. We need to be able to push that and say, don't forget you can watch so-and-so on Sky or on YouTube or on our league, you know, and, and, and do that. I just think we need to be banging the drum louder and harder. You know, the, the women that play Super League, I think, are fantastic athletes and they need a better stage in which to... So they are elite. I mentioned to Rick, they are elite women sportsmen. Mm-hmm. They should be treated They should be tre- accordingly, in my opinion. I know we've got to let you go because you've got to get to Burnley, um, which is very exciting for you. Um, yeah. We, we've got to head off to Wales because we've got a, we've got a, a meeting with the uh, chief executive there. Um It'd be nice, wouldn't it, just to talk about rugby again soon? Because as much as I enjoy the politics, I know everyone just wants to. Talk. We just want to see some action again. Yeah, we do. We talk about the politics out of disappointment and frustration that we know that we've got the product, but we don't. We don't get the best out of it, and I think that's frustrating for everybody. You know, we're proud. We're all proud. We're all fiercely proud of our sport because it's great. That's why. And when it comes back, we're talking about the rugby. It'll be brilliant. There's been some good signings in Super League. I'm looking forward to it. Champ- I can't even tell you I think it's going to win the championship. I think it's wide open, which is, fun- again, is fantastic. Um, it's exciting. It really, really is exciting. But again, as we said, it's never the on-the-field stuff that lets us down. And we just need to get the off-the-field stuff right. And if we can do that, and hopefully learn a lot of stuff this year with the streaming and, and, and everything else, the broadcasting that we're doing and with a World Cup to come at the end of it. And I think if one thing has shown us, international sport is the way forward for any big sport. We need an international game. And I, you know what? Does the guy that gets the next job in charge of Super League, is part of his remit that we've got to get a, a calendar set up. We've got to do... Do what you need to do to get an international calendar set up. And I think if we can do that, then I, then I would be a lot happier than, than maybe I am with the current off-the-field set up. 
you mentioned the Johnny May try, and of course the reason that got the purchase that it did was it was in the international arena. And that, you know, you look at the reaction of rugby league people, um, th- those particularly with bigger chips on their shoulder than others. And it's always, well, why don't you give us the uh, the recognition? We do that three times a game. The fact is, nobody is interested in the standard of that rugby union game. And, the, and the, actually, the lower the standard that game is, the more a highlight in it stands out. But because it's done on a stage that... Um, cuts across anybody who might be called an aficionado because they're watching their international team. It has much more resonance. And, mm. and you're absolutely right. I think the, the fear that I've got is that we've got a great World Cup coming up. Um, we don't know when the next one is. You know, we, we've got the Celtic Nations uh, and France playing in the World Cup. We don't know how we're going to develop the sport in those areas so that they can match England when it comes to rolling out a regular international calendar in the Northern Hemisphere that seems to be happening now in the Southern Hemisphere. Until that's taken on board, which actually isn't the remit of a chief executive of Super League or necessarily the RFL either, um, you know, we are going to struggle for our identity. Yeah, but have we ever, I don't know, I don't know if Super League have ever approached the NRL and said, look, we really need, you know, we want this international thing to work, we want you coming up. We talk about money into the sport, and we're all gutted that Aussie Tour got called off, but the Aussie Tour really should sell out three sixty thousand 60,000-seater stadiums, should do, you know, and that's money coming into the game. But then they'll be bickering who gets the money and everything. And this is, exactly. this is all the point, isn't it? You know, yeah. and this is all, these are all the things that need sorting out. You know, and we've seen Tonga emerging, Papua New Guinea playing well. There is scope for teams to come across and tour and really generate some huge income into the game. It's another opportunity that's been missed and it's been missed all the time. You mentioned the great work. The, the World Cup pre COVID, the World Cup was such an exciting tournament because you knew it was in the hands of people that knew what they were doing and were going to get the, the absolute 100% out of, you know, bang for your buck, you were going to get everything. I think we'll still get that. It's gone to the back of people's imagination because obviously we, we can't even go outside, let alone go watch a rugby game at the minute. But yeah, it, it just shows if you get right people running the sport that, that things can be done. Like it used to say on the wall at Radio Yorkshire with that picture of Ken Bates, it can be done. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, having uh, spent the last half an hour in the company of Mark Wilson, we've uh, moved from uh, Bradford to Wales to uh, be joined now by the uh, Chief Executive of the Welsh Rugby League, uh, Gareth Keir. Gareth, uh, welcome to 4020 Not Live. Uh, how are you in these strange and difficult times? Well, I guess, I guess we're the same as everybody else. You know, I'm looking, looking forward to moving out of lockdown and um, getting back to some normality and seeing some rugby league uh, played. And, and hopefully that's sometime soon and uh, obviously exciting time to Wales with the World Cup on the horizon. Yeah, it's, it's been funny really because, you know, obviously the last year has been really difficult and sad times for those people that have they've lost loved ones. But, um, you know, throughout the, the pandemic, you know, I think that you, you can look at it in two ways from a sporting perspective. It, you know, it's either a threat or it's an opportunity. And I guess for us at Wales Rugby League, we've... Um, We've managed to achieve quite a bit. And as you say, the World Cup is coming up. So a lot of preparation going on, on for our men. Um, our wheelchair pathway as well, wheelchair ranked third, uh, possibly going to play England in the semifinals of the, the World Cup. And we've also been putting a huge amount of effort into um, our women's pathway. So a huge amount of stuff going on. Everybody's been saying it's been such a troubled and difficult time and good news has, has been scarce, but there's been quite a lot of it coming out of Wales and, and not just on the obvious front that you'd think with the, the men's international team, but just about every aspect of the inclusivity of sport from statues to historic figures right through mm-hmm. to the, uh, the announcement this week that there'd be the, the Celtic Wheelchair Cup in preparation for the World Cup. You've done a lot of really good work in the most troubled of times, which, which as a CEO, must, must give you great satisfaction. Well, it does. I mean, you know, it's not all me. I've got a, a wonderful uh, team of people working with me. Um, you know, Mark Jones is our national development manager. We've got people like James Jones, who's in charge of our match officials. Alana Sargent, who's in charge of our wheelchair match officials. And a great board. 
So, and, and a whole host of volunteers that are working behind the scenes. So it really is a collective effort. I think one of the things that struck me when I came into, the, into this job was that, you know, I'm born and bred in Wales. I've been around the rugby league for, for a long time now, looking in um, as, a, as a spectator. And I think that, I think in the past, the strategy has been a little bit where, um, and a lot, I guess a lot of nations would do this, where they're promoting their men's team, and that's what they talk to people about. Uh, but what struck me was that possibly that in Wales, in South Wales in particular, you know, if you're promoting your men's team, you're, you're up against the Welsh Rugby Union men's team, World Cup semi-finalists, winning the Six Nations. You're up against the Football Association of Wales men's team, Gareth Bale, and all the things that they're doing. So, it, you know, I, I looked at it a slightly different way. I think, as you mentioned, your know, rugby league is a very inclusive sport, and I don't think people really understand, you know, what we actually do. So I, whenever I talk to broadcasters or sponsors or anybody else, like people like Sport Wales and Welsh Government, I would always start with what we're trying to do for women's sport and wheelchair sport and then bolt the men on at the back because, you know, that is still a shop window. And I think that, I think a lot of people are looking at us differently as a sport now. And, um, and I think society has changed and looking at rugby league differently as a, as a sport, you know, uh, we've been in the past discriminated against and certainly in, in Wales. And now they're looking at us a sport that offers a lot of things and, and that's opening up doors for us. And as you mentioned, the statue is uh, the statue project is is a, a really good example of uh, how things are changing. We want to come back to the historical aspect because clearly Wales has always been a, a proving ground for rugby league, but we perhaps have never quite exploited it the best we could. And it'd be be great to get your thoughts on what's gone wrong in the past and what could go right in the future. But just about the present, um, clearly you you've managed to negotiate a package from the Welsh Government, which is going to go predominantly to help keep the uh, domestic leagues afloat. And they haven't played for for close on a year like so many others. Also going to be a little bit of help for North Wales. And we've seen this this spike in publicity for West Wales with Gavin Henson and Rangi Chase. Um, It it says something about where you are as a governing body and an organisation that you can be heard by government and, and given support. Oh, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, that that wouldn't have happened a few years ago, um, you know, because we have been marginalised as a sport in in as rugby league in Wales. And some of that, I think, is possibly our, uh, our own fault. Um, but we, we engage a lot now with Sport Wales and, and uh, with the Welsh government. And, and as you say, you know, when when the news came out, the, the money that came from DCMS, uh, UK central government for of the RFL, that money wasn't available for, for Wales. I, I, and I've got to say, you know, I've got to recognise the tremendous job that Ralph Rim has done with the RFL, trying to get those things over the line. Um, they, they've worked very hard behind um, behind the scenes and, you know, kept us up to date all the way through. But it meant then that, that I had to lobby uh, Welsh government to say, look, we're in a situation here with our professional teams that are not going to get any money. And, you know, and, and as... The national governing body, you know, a, a lot of what we generate in terms of funding comes through promoting games and getting games on. Um, and they were very good. They listened to what we said. And we put, I thought we put a very strong case forward. And, you know, and they've come up with a, a £200,000 grant, which is, is, is a huge amount of money for us in terms of what we're doing. And you know, I'm very welcomed by North Wales Crusaders and West Wales. And But I think the significant thing about that is, is that we're only one of six sports in Wales. Um, we have over 80 sports, national governing bodies in Wales, and we're only one of six that's been given that grant money. So I think that that's actually, you know, as you say, we're on the map now. We're sitting at that table where we can add value to what goes on in Wales as a sport, um, but we're recognised and listened to. We spoke to Aaron Wood last week, the uh, you know the head coach of, of West yeah. Wales. And clearly, we wanted to know about the broader plans for the club. Um, but at the moment, you've got to be talking about Gavin Henson, the, the cup draw has been made. Um, he, he'd hinted in an interview that he talked to Widners. So, of course, West Wales draw Widners. Um, <laughs> he's he's, he's going to be a great draw card, A, for the sport in Wales, uh, because he seems to be extremely level-headed about where he is and what he can achieve. But it must hearten you that it gives you the opportunity to raise the profile of rugby league. Clearly, it's the men's sport. It's at the semi-professional end of it. But actually somebody like Gavin gives you a property where you can show your credibility to the rest of the country. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that, 
you know, Gavin Henson's an absolute, still an absolute legend in Wales. Uh, you know, he, and, he, and on his day, he was an absolute world beater and he's been tremendous um, for us at Rugby Union. Um, so you're absolutely right. It's been a huge amount of positive publicity uh, and well done for West Wales and Andrew Thorne for, for signing him and getting that over the line. Um, and, and, it must be, and it's been incredibly positive. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I was listening to Clive Griffiths the other day and, and he was saying about Gavin, you know, that he has been quite pragmatic about his approach to it. You know, he knows it's a challenge. He's 39 years of age. Um, but he is a man that, you know, has been there at, the, at the, the highest level in rugby. And when he puts his mind to something, um, you know, he's, he usually he can do it and he can achieve it. So I think it'll be a great game when they play witness. It's a great club to, to draw in the Challenge Cup, isn't it? You know, witness with their, their great history. Um, and, you know, the only pity is, is that we're not going to have uh, fans here because there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that a lot of people would turn up to watch not just West Wales play, but just to see how, uh, how Gavin Henson would get on. We're mentioning history, 1995 seems like ancient history now, but obviously Wales had a great World Cup, uh, the men's team in that year, uh, and the South Wales team was set up, um, which didn't quite uh, become a success. 1995, also the year when the, the, the pathway stopped for Welsh Rugby Union players coming to Rugby League to get money. How important is it for you as a governing body to, to build up the likes of, I guess, uh, Regan Grace, who is a rugby league player, he's come through the rugby league system uh, to show the pathway to young Welsh players who maybe not uh, that rugby union is the only uh, rugby sport to play? Well, I, I can't remember 1995. I was only 10 at the time. Um, but um, no, it's, it's, a, it's a point well made. I think that... Um, you know, there, there have been some, you know, huge successes over the years in, in Wales Rugby League. And, and you're absolutely right, you know, um, perhaps um, there, there may have been some false dawns. And I think um, for me, um, it's all about building something that's sustainable. And our strategy now is to build sustainable rugby league clubs. And by that, we mean that clubs that offer uh, open age or adult rugby league for men and for women, uh, for boys and for girls. And also that they promote and offer disability sports, so wheelchair, physical disability, learning disability. So we're building uh, community clubs, not just teams. I think in the past, we've had a lot of teams and, and they haven't really grown into clubs. So it's about being sustainable and, and providing accessible sport for everybody. And that, and that is starting to get us some traction. I think personally, I think that it's never a great thing just to rely on a financial benefactor because as what Celtic Crusaders proved, you, you know, if your financial benefactor steps away, then what are you left with? So it's got to be a hybrid approach where whatever the club is, whatever the professional club is, that's very much part of the national governing body strategy to grow the game. And you're working in unison. Um, you know, and that is our strategy at the moment to work in partnership with, with North Wales Crusaders in, in North Wales and West Wales Crusaders in West Wales. So we're working together and we, as a governing body, we run the, the national development pathways and that our clubs who are the, perhaps a shop window they concentrate and doing as well as they can in, in the competition so i think that you've got to go it organically there's got to have a, there's got to be a base to it can't buy success overnight and you're right you know we've got we've had some great players and we have over, over the years you know and, and regan is a is a perfect example when at 15 years of age, he was told that he wasn't going to make it um, in rugby union, and he came to play rugby league. And there's a lot of players like that in, in Wales, men and women, um, where you know they're not going to make one sport. And you know, I, I believe in a multi-sport uh, approach. So I'm trying to build bridges now with Welsh rugby union to say to them, well, look, when you don't want those players in your professional game because they're not big enough, and usually that's re the reason why, we can be another exit route for those players. So they already understand the professional, a professional game, nutrition, discipline, attitude. We can pick those up and we can give them another opportunity to perhaps have a, a professional career. And so, you know, I think that's a work in progress, but there are certainly a lot of open-minded people in, in Wales, in, in rugby union that are starting to see that there, there is that potential. So, you know, that, that's what the future looks like for us. I think that we're building it the right way uh, and we're building it from the bottom up. You talk a lot about sustainability of the clubs, of the pathways, of the personnel. What about the international game? Because clearly um, we do need 
mid-season internationals. We do need to try and replicate something in the Northern Hemisphere that is along the lines of what seems to be happening in the Southern Hemisphere with the Pacific nations. There's a lot of talk of uh, England need to have a regular international with France. Um, but if we're really serious, we need to have regular internationals between England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland and France. And, and we need to get into this regularity of fixture whereby you can call on the best players that you have available. You can use each four year period to build up to a World Cup. Um, I know you offered to play England um, with, with Sean Wayne desperately wanting a game for his team. Where, where do you see the future of the international game and do we take it seriously enough if we're ever going to really be a high profile sport? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, historically we probably haven't taken it seriously enough. I think that, you know, with the emergence of Tonga and players putting their hands up and saying, well, no, actually, you know, I want to play for Tonga. I don't want to play for, for Australia. I think that has changed things drastically. And I think now that in the Southern Hemisphere, it's not just Australia and New Zealand. You know, you, you've got Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, Papua New Guinea, who are, you know, progressing all the time. And I think that means that they've looked at the Northern Hemisphere and, and they're starting to think, well, you know, what do we provide? Um, it, it, we can't go on just having England versus France every year. You know, that's not developing the game. So, you know, I've always believed that uh, uh, a strong Wales will mean a stronger England. And the same goes for Scotland and for Ireland. And so what we've got to do is commit together as national governing bodies. And I think there's a re there is a an intent from the RFL. I think they understand this now. And I think that, we have to have an international weekend, but it has to be a proper international weekend. I mean, with that, and by that, I mean, there are no games. There are no games. So there's no pressure on players. There's no pressure on coaching staff. You know, people, it's a difficult thing when we, even though the operational rules say that people can and must be released to play for the country, we have a lot of players that play in the championship and coaches. Um, that puts a lot of pressure on them because they, they want to, serve the club well and be loyal to the club and they also want to play for the country and I think perhaps you know this year of all years is one year where we're really sensitive to that because the clubs have done a lot to keep going they're already in really difficult circumstances they need home games for revenue and I think as a governing body we don't want to put people under that pressure but what I would say is we're absolutely passionate about having a mid-season international which is a free weekend which we would then see England, uh, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, France, you know, possibly even Italy. And if you look at the reunion Six Nations, that's what we've got to generate. And look, at the start off, there may be some blowouts in that, but that's what we've got to do. We've got to be, have the, the intent to do it and the passion and the confidence to carry on with that. And, and not just for the men. You know, I'm passionate about the women's game as well. I, think, I personally believe that Women's Rugby League is, is a vehicle to grow rugby league generally and possibly in some areas, I think in, in Wales, Scotland, Ireland, probably can grow it as quick, if not quicker, with a women's game. And we are much closer to England in that gap, that performance gap, uh, as we would be with France. And so you've got to look at the men, the women and the wheelchair um, as a property. You just mentioned the women's game. Obviously, Wales not part of this World Cup coming up. What's the... Uh, aims for the the women's team. I get, I get, obviously, it's to grow and, and to, to get as many players as possible. But you just appointed a new coach in, in Thomas Brindle, who is a, a very passionate supporter of the women's game. Yeah, uh, Tom is, is brilliant, and um, you know he was he was the pick of the bunch when we interviewed. Um, very passionate about it, understands it, coached internationally at, at the women's level. Um, but, but, but as I've just mentioned. I have been absolutely blown away by how women take to, to rugby league so quickly, you know, and traditionally perhaps in Wales, we've looked at, you know, players migrating from rugby union, women migrating from rugby union to rugby league. But actually what I'm starting to see, and when I was out in Sydney last year at the nines, is that there's a lot of girls who play netball or football can actually play rugby league because of the nature of the game. So, for us, uh, women's rugby league is a real, really uh, key strategy for us in promoting that. Uh, you're right, we're disappointed the emerging nations didn't happen. We felt we could do really well. At, and, and I'll be honest, I'm forever banging on John Dutton's door saying if someone doesn't turn up for the World Cup, we're only just across the border. Our kit bags are ready and we'll, we'll be there if needed. Um, but, I, you know, we want to be, and I believe we can be, this is not a pipe dream, we can be a top four side um, and with our women's international side. I genuinely, genuinely believe that. So, you know, for the next World Cup, 
you know, we would be serious contenders for that. And, and that's given the talent that we have and how easy, it, how, it, how easy it is for those girls to come and play rugby league. They come and they, when they start, it's less complicated. It's easier. It's more fun to play. They understand it. Um, and they get more out of it. And, and that's why I think is a, is a key strategic part to this that we've got to really push women's rugby league forward. Clearly, from everything you're saying, there's a more integrated approach to uh, developing the sport across the United Kingdom as much as in Wales. And maybe that's something we, we haven't had enough of before. Just finishing on the, on the women's game, um, would it help you, for example, if Wales were given a place in the Women's Super League? Um, would that hasten the development of the Welsh players? Would it give them exposure to a higher standard of rugby? Would it help the identity of and the pathways in Wales, if, if you could have that elite team at the top of it. And is that something we should be looking at replicating in other areas of the sport? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the examples I always look at is, is Papua New Guinea. You know, they, they, it's, their, it's their national game. But before they had the PNG Hunters, how good were they internationally? I, I'm not sure that they really performed that well. But when the NRL decided they would give them a franchise and support them, um, then their game has taken off and they're a completely different side now. And that's the same for the men and for the women. So I, I absolutely sub subscribe to that, you know, and that's, and I have to say to you that, you know, we're working very closely with the likes of Mark Leverin and Ralph Rimmer and all of his executive board, because I don't believe we should be reinventing the wheel in Wales in terms of rugby league. Yes, we have value to bring to it. Yes, we do see, see things, some things differently. And I think that's important as well. But we are working very closely together. And it's absolutely the case, isn't it, that if you want to grow the sport, that you would have uh, an elite pathway for men and for women in Wales, but not just Wales. You'd have it in Scotland, and potentially in Ireland as well, as we do in, as we do in France. And I think that that model absolutely works. And just moving on to, to wheelchair. We, we, we've got the Celtic Cup announced all things. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we can uh, we can get teams together. That concept of Celtic, um, there's been talk of the exiles playing England. Would a first bridging step, if we're only going to have maybe one international mid-season or end of season as a warm-up, can you see a combined Celtic men's and or women's team playing England to, before you perhaps break back into your, your, your individual nationalities? Would that have more meaning? Well, it's, 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 it's a debatable point, isn't it? And it's, and it's an interesting one. I mean, I think it's one that you can't just dismiss. Um, I, I would say, though, I think that at some point you've got to take that, that leap of faith and you've got to play those games, you know. And, and look, I, I, I'm born and bred in Cardiff. I've grown up on rugby union. I can remember the All Blacks putting 50, 60 points on our, our men's national side of rugby union. I can remember sides like England doing it, you know? So you're going to go, so those blowouts are going to come, but, and the only way I think you get better is by playing the best. Um, and you have to be prepared to do that. So, you know, possibly I think there, there's a need for that, but, you know, I think that our view would be, and with all of our performance staff for all of our pathways, you know, we're pushing very much to, to play, you know, Wales as a nation, we're really proud of our international shirts. So Wales as a nation in wheelchair, men and women. At that wheelchair rugby league World Cup, which is going to have great coverage uh, from the BBC, so people are going to be exposed to the sport for the first time, and and exposed to a sport which is possibly, I'm just thinking about this now, as inclusive as you can get, males and females playing together, able-bodied and people who who use wheelchairs, anyone can have a go at wheelchair rugby league. It's a brilliant sport, isn't it? You know, and, and you're absolutely right. It, it is the most inclusive because, you know, there's no age barrier. There's no gender barrier. There's no ability barrier. Everyone. And, and that's part of what I love about it, because, you know, parents and guardians can play with, with, with the children and their siblings and you can play with aunties and uncles and all, and of all abilities. And, you know, that's that's a great thing about rugby league is, you know, being inclusive is part of our DNA. We, we don't, we're not just doing this as a tick box now because it's in vogue. We've done this for 125 years. We've always tried to do the hard things and get people involved. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that the rugby league is, a, is wheelchair rugby league is a brilliant sport. And, and, you, know, and, and you know, and going on from that, we've, we've managed to secure £50,000 from, from Sport Wales to, to support that because 
uh, our wheelchair international side. They're ranked third in the world. And people like Steve Jones and Mark Jones have been behind that and pioneers of our wheelchair rugby league in Wales, you know, for the last seven or eight years. They probably haven't had as much support as they should have from us, the governing body. But now they're one of our three elite teams. We, we're trying to treat them and give them the same experience. And that money that we've got is going to mean that for the, for the World Cup and for the Celtic Cup that, you know, they'll have uh, international elite wheelchairs. Um, and that's the difference between an international uh, elite wheelchair is £3,000, about give or take. A community wheelchair is about £1,000. That's the difference between buying a second-hand Mini or a brand-new Ferrari, and, and that, that is the difference. And so for me, before we go on in any game in Wales, before we put it, we want to be on, an, and an, you know, we have to be sort of equally prepared to give ourselves every opportunity. So we've got that for our, for our national team, but we've also got two new teams as part of existing community clubs in Torvine Tigers and Cardiff Blue Dragons, where the, the, the clubs, the chairs we bought by us as governing body, and we we'll loan 10 chairs to Torvine and 10 chairs to, to Cardiff Blue Dragons. And then they can start to offer that as well. So, so we're creating that, that uh, opportunity for everybody to get involved, as well as building our international pathway. We spoke to Ontario Rugby League last week, and they were saying, again, very much like you, that it isn't necessarily the men's game that's going to be the driver, that that will come along in, in the aftertow, if you like. And they pointed at Masters as being their key in. Um, again, is that an area where you feel that um, Welsh men of a certain age may, or, or even women may, well be predisposed to continuing a rugby career and, and putting money over clubhouse bars because it's an under-exploited area and, and something now that, that will come under your control? It, it already has. Um, you know, so we also run the Masters uh, international side uh, for men and we're looking to do that for women as well. And we've got you know, again, people like Ryan Roberts in North Wales, who is someone who's been promoting that. Uh, and when I when I first spoke to him about a year ago, um, you know, we we were saying, look, we want you to be part of our family. But if you're going to be part of our family, you have to buy into our code of conduct. You have to buy into our values and everything that we do. This can't be a pub team, but this has to be a team that allows people of a certain age to carry on playing and promoting the game. And they they bought into that massively. So. You know, and again, that's part of the inclusive nature, isn't it? It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, under seven or under eight, a boy or a girl, that, or, or someone who's who's 40 or 50 or 60 years of age. You, you can continue to play all the way through. So that's something that we've already done. I know that the Code Breakers program had a, a big impact on you and, um, and, and got a few people in Wales saying there's been grave injustice here and it's something that we're guilty of. And I know that from that as on the statue project which of course um, had some fantastic feedback and a lot of people got involved in that again if you can give us some details of how you've narrowed it down to the three people you've chosen but the fact that you had such a long list of people as well was 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 a credit to the sport there um attitudes have changed haven't they it, it, and it's not just rugby league playing in the summer and rugby union playing in the winter there there is a, a, probably as great a degree of coexistence now as there's ever been yeah, I think timing is everything, isn't it? I think society has changed, you know, and, and that for me is the key. You know, I think that as a society, you know, we don't, discrimination in any form is just not acceptable. Um, and I think that, you know, I, as I say, born and bred in Wales, when I grew up, uh, rugby league was the work of the devil. Um, you know, it was a terrible sport. People got paid to play. And, you know, my father would be telling me, we don't watch that. We don't talk to them. They don't come in our rugby club. Well, okay, I just thought that's how it was. And, and then when you get into it and you start to scratch the surface and understand it a little bit better and you, you understand, you know, the history of broken time payments and, and, and everything else that's gone on. And, you know, and the, the, the documentary with Caroline Hebb was incredible. And I, you know, that's something that I share with a lot of people. All of our board directors were made to watch as part of their induction. And all of them, and including myself when I first said, would say, I didn't know that. All of my friends who I played rugby union with and have grown up with, they didn't know that. Because it's, it's, it's being suppressed, that part of that history was something that they didn't want us to know. And now it's, it's coming out. And the way I see it is not about apportioning blame to what happened 50, 60, 70 years ago. It's about learning from that and thinking, looking how sport can have a real positive impact on society. And that's what I see with rugby league. And, and so this, this statue project is really very much about that, you know, 
Well, the root, the roots may be may be planted 50, 60, 70 years ago, but it's very much about today. It's about looking forward, not looking back. And you're absolutely right. We had a huge response to to the, the poll that we put out there. Some great players on it, and and then the whole process as well was was in, involved people like Jonathan Davis and Jim Mills, who's been a real great support of this. Uh, Sir Stanley Thomas, who, who's the chair of it. Um, and we were able also to have our men and women's captains involved in it. So, so Ellie Key was a men's captain um, and, and Raph Taylor was, was our women's captain. And, and, and actually, and in that story, Raph Taylor um, grew up in Tiger Bay, Cardiff Bay now, 120 metres from where Billy Boston lived. Uh, Gus Risman grew up in Tiger Bay. So it, it, for me, it shows how that's gone full circle, you know, Raph is really proud of her black heritage and it's something that she really, really promotes. So for her to be a black women's captain on the panel voting for a statue for black rugby league players, potentially in Cardiff Bay, well not, not potentially, definitely in Cardiff Bay, it's a huge thing. And, and, you know, it's not just about the discrimination that happened to, to Clive Sullivan and Billy Boston. You know, Gus Risman as well, he was a Russian immigrant you know, who moved for, uh, north and played for Salford and had a tremendous career. So it goes to show how diverse our sport is, but it's important that it acts as a signpost for the future, that we say, look, we can't do this. We have to be inclusive and, and give everyone equal opportunities. And that's, for me, it's just the start of a process because it can't just be a statue in, in Cardiff. It's got to be a way of educating people. It's got to be an educational side to deliver to the, to the medium of rugby league. And, you know, I'm incredibly proud about this. And Hugh Thomas, who's the leader of Cardiff City Council, He's involved, what well, government are getting involved. We've got a lot of other people who are getting involved in this. And, and it's all about how society is changing. They're recognizing that things in the past weren't right, but we can't make a difference now. Final one from me. You, you mentioned Sir Clive Sullivan. I call him Sir Clive Sullivan. He wasn't nice. He's like Kerry and Sinfield, but I, I, it's just an automatic reaction. <laughs> you mentioned Clive Sullivan, who scored that famous winning try in, in a World Cup yeah. uh, World Cup draw, uh, lifted the World Cup. Um, how much are you looking forward to this year's tournaments and, and uh, difficult challenges for the, the Welsh men's team? John Key has got, a, got his work cut out with those very tough opponents, but Hopefully a chance to see perhaps Regan Gray score a try like uh, Clive Sullivan did in France. Well, you know, I think our group has been named the group of death. And, you know, if this if the World Cup was in the Southern Hemisphere, it would definitely be that. There's no two ways about it. Um, but, you know, we're in the Northern Hemisphere. And we, you know, so we're playing Cook Islands on our first game um, on a Wednesday night at, um, uh, at Lee. Uh, you know, and so you know, we're doing our rain dance and making sure there's going to be pouring down with rain and freezing cold. And I think that's a different set of circumstances, you know, and, um, and, and we're hoping for the same when we play Papua New Guinea and Doncaster uh, um, on a cold Monday night. So it's a great challenge. We, we play Tonga in St. Helens. You know, what, what a great game. We've never played Tonga as a nation. What a great game that's going to be. It's going to be fantastic crowds there, a lot of anticipation. Um, so you just accept that because that's the same as playing, you know, New Zealand, Australia or England. It's just a great occasion to be involved in. We know the challenge is a huge challenge for us in our first in our opening game. And, and, you know, Cook Islands have got some real quality in their team. But I've got to say that, you know, John Keir has done a, a great job with, with our squad. We have a great balance um, and, and a, an incredible culture. People want to play for Wales now. You, you never play for Wales for money. You play because it's for the shirt. And, and that's the same for our men's team as it is for our women, as it is for our wheelchair. So if you coach Wales, Captain Wales and the CEO of Wales Rugby League, you have to have the surname Keir? Going forward, that is a rule now, yes. <laughs> Going on to sort of John Keir and, and the role that he can have for you, everybody knows what a, a respected coach he is. And it's not just at club level, his achievements, but clearly, um, you know, he's, he's coached in France, uh, he's coached England uh, nationally. It, he is really important for you. And, and again, just linking it back to the statue and greater awareness now of the role of the Welsh in the development of coaching. This is building on a legacy of somebody like Roy Francis, who I know at the moment is extremely high profile, even outside of Wales, as to being the father of modern coaching. Um, John's contribution, the fact that you've got him as a name, the fact that that history is there behind him. Again, all things you can build on leading into this uh, this World Cup campaign, I would think. Yeah, and I, 
I think John has done an incredible job thus far. You know, he's all about positive culture, you know, being honest with yourself and being honest with the, your, your teammates and respecting yourself and respecting your teammates. And what he has built um, is a brilliant international culture. You know, it's, it's not easy for our players at the end of the year. They've had a tough season, Super League, Championship, whatever that may be. So he, what he has done is create a culture where, you know, you've got to be proud to play for Wales. That's what it, it matters. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not, it's not a draconian environment. When the players are coming to us, you know, we need to create an, a situation where they want, they want to be picked. So they're going to come to us, you know, prepared and, and ready to play. If you ask John, he will say it's, it's the best time of the season for him. He enjoys the Wales camp probably more than anything else he does. And I think, and, and I think a lot of our players would would say exactly the same. You know, you know, they look forward to playing for Wales. They look forward to being together. We have got some senior players who've been there for ten years now, um, who all come through the system together. So they like being together. And that balance of that experience and the youth coming coming through is, it's a brilliant environment to be in. And, and you know, look, happy teams are, are often successful. And you know, I would say that we got a really happy um, environment and good, great culture. I mean, there's, there's very few finer things in sport than watching the uh, uh, any Welsh side stand up and uh, belt out the anthem. And uh, we look forward to seeing that uh, come the autumn. Gareth, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know we'll be checking in throughout the year with the various aspects of Welsh Rugby League and we look forward to that. And uh, we, we wish you well and, and hopefully you stay safe and uh, we'll, we'll see you again soon. One, one final much, question. How's yeah. Elliot, how's Elliot going to go this year? <laughs> But that's a trick question, isn't it, really? Oh. Um, uh, listen, I, I think that, um, you know, as a family, we're really proud of what he's achieved. But, you know, um, a lot of the players in our squad call me fake dad because I've known him for so long, you know, and you know, and I've always gone around the world to watch them all. And I'm really proud of them all. You know, Gil Judson, Lloyd White, uh, Reese Williams, um, you know, Rodri. We've got some, so many great players that have been together for a long time. And then we got the new bats coming through, you know, um, yeah, we're, so we're just really proud of them all. And, and they, they all, it means so much for them all to, to represent uh, Wales. So I'm sure whatever happens, it'll be an exciting season. I would say some words in Welsh, but I don't want to embarrass myself uh, and, and get it completely wrong. So uh, I'll, I'll just wish you very best of luck for the rest of the year, Gareth. And uh, thank you very much for joining us on 4020.live. My pleasure. Thanks, guys.